You guys are making progress, huh, Dave? Yeah. Getting a little warm for them. At 510, are you getting your folks in there okay? Affirmative. Uh, they're trying to get organized. Well, you better tell them to hustle it up. That finger's heading right toward your tail right now. Affirmative. Are we, are we still on hold, George? Are we cleared? You're still on hold. we got to get that helicopter out in front of that thing off the ground first. Okay. Yeah, I'm doing the best I can, George. I'm trying to get them motivated. Not copy, Mike. Uh, that's getting going to be pretty hot right behind your tail here for a, in a minute here. And uh, if, uh, if they can't get their stuff in gear there and that starts picking up speed, you might want to just to load them up and clear them. I understand. Just that little waiting right there uh, changed our strategy here now. That thing really broke out of the perimeter, didn't it? Yeah. Full IC, engine 2260. BLM, team of action. Mike, I guess I just have to tell you this imperative. Get those guys in and get them out of there. We're on Smoke Creek, Grants Road. Uh, is there a marker? 510, did you We're copy that up, Victor? Get them on the helicopter. They're not reacting. On the main road, coming into Bull. Uh, zero, Dave. Six, tanker 12, we're on yeah. downwind. You want us to get something between the helicopter and that fire? Yeah, let's go try it. All right, Mike, we're going to come right across between the head and you with that tanker right now. Just stay on the ground right there for a second. Uh, thank you. Dave, uh, get your folks on that helicopter now. I'm pulling off to the left just as soon as, the, in about 10 seconds. 10 seconds, I'm coming out airport. Yeah, get that helicopter You got your folks out of there? Affirmative, we're all up. Okay, thanks. Now. Okay, hold on, 12. He's coming out to the west, and he's got his folks on. Okay, just warming up, guys. All right, 12 uh, and 05, you see the helicopter bending to the west. And uh, what we've done is we're going to go ahead and change strategies now as the heel of the fire is on the west side. We want to take the right flank where it starts to burn hot and carry it on toward the east. Or if you want to come back against the wind, uh, it might be a little smoky. We'll start flanking hey, this thing as it's blowing out. out safely, and I'm mad as hell at them. <laughs> okay, Mike, thanks for your help there. What the ancients called a clever fighter is one who not only wins, but excels in winning with ease. Hence, his victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage. He wins his battles by making no mistakes. Twenty-five hundred years ago, the Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu outlined the first recorded military theories, a book of strategies and tactics that continues to be used in military training today. What has made Sun Tzu's writings timeless was his focus. His theories were not concerned with the latest technological advancements, but rather they concentrated on the human aspect of waging war the art of directing and coordinating an army. He wrote about making tactical decisions, keeping up morale, and assuring good communication. This was not an easy task. In Sun Tzu's time, keeping an army of more than 100,000 soldiers coordinated, communicating, and ready for action was difficult. The struggle was a human one. In the following 25 centuries, empires rose and fell based on the decisions of their kings, leaders, commanders, and soldiers. Throughout history, the importance of the human factor is a lesson that has been continuously learned, forgotten, and learned again. The lessons were not limited to the battlefield. History has ample records of great expeditions, projects, and adventures that succeeded or failed on the decisions, actions, and reactions of the men and women involved. In our lifetime, we've witnessed amazing technological advancements. For example, message runners, which were used until the early 1900s, are now replaced by radios and satellite data links. But under all the technological advancements lies this core truth. 
the controlling mechanism is still the human mind. Through modern technologies, we've extended our control over our environment to unparalleled levels. But just as human abilities to think and reason can be turned into great accomplishments, common human errors can result in great failures. Now more than ever, we realize that as the use of advanced technological tools increases, so does the responsibility to manage and hone our mental tool set. Advanced technology does not excuse us from thinking, but rather, advanced technology provides us reason to think harder. Although improvements in technology have eased our lives in countless ways, it has also enabled us to work and play in new extreme environments. Here, the difference between life and death depends as much on the strength of your mind as on the amount of high-tech equipment you take with you. Today, more than ever before, people are engaging in high-risk activities in extreme environments. Many are drawn by the personal challenge. For others, it's their business. Those who become the very best at functioning in these extreme environments are the ones who constantly strive to improve their performance and skills. Working in an extreme environment is difficult enough for one or two people. But what about having to work in an extreme environment with many people? Across the world, countless organizations face the daunting task of coordinating the actions of many people in high-risk work environments. Reducing risk in these work environments means anticipating human error, so it can be avoided whenever possible. And when errors do occur, they're detected and handled right away. For example, the launch and recovery operations aboard an aircraft carrier require split-second timing and the coordination of hundreds of people. In this environment, the tolerance for error is low, and expectations for performance are high. This organization works continuously to reduce the frequency of error as a standard part of the job. Now let's look at another organization and how they deal with human error. This unit of Special Forces soldiers is preparing for a counterinsurgency mission here, they're rehearsing to target and interdict key guerrilla lines of communication. Oh. Reload. Reload. I got the bag! It's moving. Let's go! Fire in the hole! As part of standard operating procedure, they debrief the day's events against their performance objectives. I think so. Uh, Chris is here, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm going to facilitate the AAR. Basically, let's go over what, what was the plan, what was supposed to happen. Rob, you want to? Okay. plan was, obviously, to capture the, uh, the courier and to neutralize... The practice the helps to assure that each member understands what happened and plans are made to improve the team's performance in the next engagement. During the debrief, the team reviews both good and substandard performance. Here, they focus on adherence to standard operating procedures, techniques and errors, and make plans to correct errors during the next engagement. What did happen? Rich, uh, why don't we hear from you, because you were our right anchor. What did you see as you... Well, actually, let's start with Chris, because you, you took the sniper shot, so... Had it had a clear view of the objective. The only thing I felt like is I was way too close to the target. Uh -huh. I, I felt like I'd have wanted to have been farther back out over in the trees or something, but identified the target, identified the bag, and took the shot. I think I hit the knee. Even though some of these soldiers are participating as instructors, they all continuously work as students to learn. 
That's because this soldier and the organization he works for understands an undeniable truism. Regardless of the latest technological advancements in equipment and weaponry, the most versatile and important tool in this dynamic, high-risk work environment is his own mind. Here we see another high-risk work environment. Only this isn't a training exercise. This is the real thing. And here, as in any extreme environment, the chances for error are high and the potential consequences are grave. Because wildland fire is a dynamic, high-risk, and sometimes extreme environment, it makes sense that you, as a firefighter, should know yourself as well as your technical tools. And that, in a nutshell, is the purpose of this program. To familiarize you with a mental tool set and to help you understand your responsibility for using these tools so you can work effectively as part of a team operating in a high-risk environment. Now, what do I mean by your responsibility? In the extreme environments we saw earlier, those people understood a professional duty. And the duty isn't about simply showing up and being there. It's about minimizing unnecessary risk, executing plans, and adapting to changes as they occur. A professional is always aware of their situation and learns to recognize the factors that are most important. A professional is part of a team, working with other people again and again in an environment that poses many hazards and challenges, doing it right and without unnecessary risk. A professional takes on the responsibility to think, to learn from their experiences, and to do a better job each day. This aspect of the job never ends, and it's sometimes the hardest part of the job. Hi, welcome to Human Factors on the Fire Line. During this session, I'll be one of your guides as we talk about a series of human performance concepts designed specifically for you, a wildland firefighter. There are three basic objectives for this program. The first is awareness. Now, by that, I mean recognizing and understanding some of the basic human performance issues and problems when you encounter them on the line. The second is tools. Just as there's a set of tools for every tactic we employ on the line, there's also a mental tool set for many of the common human problems we encounter. And the third is practice. As you all know, mastering any tool takes a lot of time and practice. These mental tools are no different. So throughout the course of this program, we'll be taking some time to try out a few of these tools so you can get a feel for them. Before we get started, let me put a couple things on the table. First, this isn't a safety program. Although many of the topics we'll be discussing have obvious safety ramifications, the focus here is on doing things correctly and minimizing error. Safety is a result of doing things correctly. Secondly, this program is not about fixing a problem. It's simply about making you aware of some tools and concepts that can make you better at what you're already trained to do, fighting fire. Take a look at this example. Here at the U.S. Navy Top Gun School, professional Navy pilots, pilots who are already flying combat missions, are taken back to school to learn how to be the very best pilots. In this school, every maneuver, action, tactic, and technique is broken down into its primary pieces and then reassembled again with a better understanding. Pilots learn not only what to do, but also why they do it. This better understanding helps them to improvise, react, and be more effective in this dynamic environment. In a sense, this program does the same thing on a smaller scale. You've been dealing with human factors since you were born. You're well acquainted with many common human factors. You know them as stressed out, tired, frustrated, or overloaded. Here, we'll take these familiar factors, break them down, and talk about them. Then, later on, we'll put them all back together again and apply them to your work on the fire line. 
The success of a program like this depends on a team effort. I'll be responsible for demonstrating some of these concepts, as will your instructor, and your instructor will provide plenty of opportunities for you to discuss the concepts and apply them to your individual circumstances. To do this, you'll work through a series of exercises with others in your class, and you'll be asked to think about your individual situation and identify some tools or techniques to improve your fireline performance. Finally, you'll be given an opportunity to try some of these tools. This mental tool set will include techniques to improve communication in high-risk situations, including specific communication responsibilities, a self-check for your situation awareness, a risk management decision aid, and basic teamwork guidelines. By the time we finish today, you'll have a better grasp of what can cause human errors in your work and what you can do to anticipate and mitigate them. You'll have some good ideas about how to make yourself a better firefighter. And you'll have some tools to help you accomplish that. So, without any further delay, let's get going. This pilot is en route to a mission to bomb an enemy radar site. And if you think there isn't much going on right now, think again. During this mission, the pilot keeps a mental picture of his relative position in space through use of the plane's instrumentation and using outside references if they're available. He constantly updates his mental image of his position relative to the target, the changes in the terrain, enemy threats, and even the air tanker that will refuel him after he's completed his mission. Although the environment is real, the way the pilot reacts to the changes in the environment is based totally upon his perception. If his perception of the situation doesn't include all the critical factors, such as an enemy missile heading his way, then too bad, so sad, as the pilots say. Reality always wins in the end. Understandably, he's motivated to make his perception of the environment match reality as closely as possible and how well his perception matches reality is called situation awareness, or SA. So how does situation awareness work? The fire doesn't change because of how you perceive it. The fire changes, in part, based on what actions you take or don't take. The action you take depends on the decisions that you make. And what you decide is based on how you perceive the situation. If you don't have a good grasp of the situation, your decisions and actions probably won't be effective in the real environment. We're going to get into decision making later in the program, but right now, let's take a close look at situation awareness, since it's at the root of everything an effective firefighter does. Everyone starts with an initial perception of what's going on. This initial perception forms as the result of your past experience and your current attitudes. But your initial perception is only a starting point. Continuously, you gather new information, updating and changing your perception of the situation. When you sat down to view this program, you had an initial perception. Call it a size-up about the program. This will probably be a drag, or this should be interesting. Between then and now, you've continuously updated your assessment, gathering more information and changing it as appropriate. This cycle is called the Situation Awareness, or SA cycle, and it continues as long as you're awake. Everyone has some level of Situation Awareness. Paying attention is one part of Situation Awareness, but another part of it is knowing what to pay attention to, knowing what's important. Here are some homeowners fighting fire to protect their property. As inexperienced firefighters, most of these people don't know what things to look for or how to identify dangerous problems. No matter how hard they work physically today, the situation awareness and the effectiveness of these new firefighters will not be good. Until they know and understand more, they'll depend on intuition and luck to keep them out of harm's way. Information must be continuously gathered into the situation awareness cycle to keep it up to date. During this process, you take in new information from a variety of external sources. Most sources fall under two general categories. Information you observe directly, and information that's communicated to you from others. 
Without new information, your situation awareness cycle will go stale. In the perfect world, our situation awareness would encompass every factor in the environment, but that isn't realistic. On the fire line, many things compete for our attention. Distraction is a real problem. Also, we can't directly observe or understand all the information that constantly bombards us. To handle the load, our brains naturally filter out parts of the environment that we deem as not important. When you're working on a fire, what pieces of information do you gather to size up your situation? Superintendent 662. Boomer, you find that lookout spot, okay? Uh, not quite there. Should be there approximately two minutes. Okay, give me a holler when you get in place. Good copy. You have a duty as professional firefighters to establish and maintain effective communications at all times. Good communication is vital to your awareness of the work environment and to your crew's ability to perform at their highest level. We've all studied the watch-out situations. These watch-outs are clearly identified fire line hazards. The three communications watch-outs shown here will definitely affect your situation awareness. We also know about the standard firefighting orders. The firefighting orders are a tool used to help mitigate major fire line hazards. Communication is also interwoven into all ten of these orders. How will you get a forecast without the ability to communicate? pretty hard to get much information about the fire without communicating with someone. How will individual firefighters know what the fire is doing or expected to do without communication? How will you make the escape routes known without communicating that information to others? What good are lookouts without communication? Without good communication, how will you get the information you need to think clearly and act decisively? This is a pretty easy one, isn't it? Giving clear instructions is a big part of good communication. Maintaining control without being able to communicate? Now that would be a challenge. Establishing good communication is the foundation for safe and effective operations. You can see by this quick look through our fire safety guidelines that communication is one of the most critical functions on the fire line. Almost nothing can happen in a firefighting operation without effective communication. I mean, just think of all the things we have to communicate during a fire. Weather observations. Fire behavior changes. Requests for more resources. Warnings. Work instructions. New safety zone and escape route locations. The list is endless. On the fire line, there are as many ways to communicate as there are things to communicate, and you're required to be proficient in many of them. How well you can use these methods directly affects your situation awareness, your effectiveness, and ultimately, your safety. We've talked about communications in general, and we've seen some examples of effective communication. We know that good communication is critical to both individual and crew situation awareness. But just what does all that mean to you? How do we get good communication on the fire line? Communication is the exchange of information. Any communication requires a sender, the talker, a receiver, the listener, and a method to deliver the information. Since communication requires both a talker and a listener, it's a little difficult to exchange information when both people are talking. So, the model we'd like to use for the fire line is a lot like using this radio. When one person talks, the other one listens. And when we talk about techniques for improving your communication skills, I'd like you to think of them literally as tools. A Pulaski, a shovel, chainsaw, that you can pull out of your toolbox and apply to whatever communications task is at hand. A little while ago, we saw that communication has one talker, the sender, and one listener, the receiver. 
And we saw what happens when two people try to send and receive at the same time, confusion. Well, one powerful tool to help achieve a clear understanding is switching roles between sender and receiver frequently during a communication. This kind of feedback, this trade-off between talking and listening, may sound like common sense. But watch this example and see if it doesn't sound familiar. How you doing? Charlie Bork from Sequoia. Good to see you here. Hey, we have a couple small fires happening right now, and uh, I'd like to have you and your crew staff one of the fires. Okay. They're going to helicopter you in okay. to one of them. Be prepared to stay for a couple days. All right. And we'll get back to you. Okay. Um, oh, all right. How effective was their communication? You notice there was only one sender and one receiver, and they never switched roles. Let's try it again. This time, notice how much more information gets communicated with a little more give and take between the sender and the receiver. Any questions? Yeah, who's the IC? That would make a difference, wouldn't it? You will be the IC. Okay, do you have any information on the, the location of the fire and um, the area I'm going into? I will get a map for you in the legal, and uh, at this time, uh, you're looking at the fuel type as the same elevations as what we're, where we're at now. Okay, is there any specific hazards I need to know about for my crew? Yeah, at this time, I really don't know. Okay, great. Just uh, where's the helibase at and uh, who's in charge? The helibase is about a half mile back up this road here. It's flagged to be on your left side there. There's a helicopter manager there. I'll call and make sure that uh, they know you're coming to manifest you and your crew. Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. I just first time taking my crew and I don't want to screw up and make any major mistakes. I understand that. And uh, any additional information, I'll be sure to relay on to you. Great. Appreciate it. Now that's communication. It took a little longer than that first exchange, but look how much more information was communicated. Another tool that can help you communicate better is the direct statement. It's a little like communications on steroids. It can be a very powerful tool for the sender. Direct communication is straight and to the point. It cuts through any distraction and leaves very little room for misunderstandings. The boomer. It seems like the wind's coming out of the south now. It feels a lot stronger than they predicted. Think we're going to have any problems down below? By contrast, indirect communication, less committal and more roundabout, leaves the sender and out. Listen to this. It seem like the wind's picking up at all? We don't naturally gravitate towards direct communication. It can be seen as assertive or even rude. Sometimes, when we bring up problems, we kind of feel like we're going out on a limb, and it can be pretty lonely out there. But in the time-sensitive, stressful environment of the fire line, especially when there are problems, direct communication is the preferred tool for clear and effective communication. Direct statements are powerful tools, but they require some practice. When we're done here, we'll give you a chance to work with them a little. There are six major components to a direct statement all of which help to assure that the communication process is solid. First, when you want to make a direct statement, use the person's name that you're talking to. This clearly establishes who is the intended receiver of your message. Second, use I. I think, I believe, I feel. Using I tells the other person that you're taking ownership of what you're about to say. It makes it clear that the statement is coming from you and establishes you as the sender. Third, state your message as clearly as possible. This helps assure the message gets there intact without being diverted or muddled by non-essential information. Fourth, use the appropriate emotion for your message. Yes, emotion, but that's not to be confused with emotional. When you communicate, your message is always placed in a wrapping of emotion that conveys context. Things like urgency, frustration, or casualness. As a sender, your messages can get muddled when the message and the wrapping don't match up. The listener won't be sure what your message really is. You don't have to be overly dramatic, but it's just as important not to sabotage your message by understating your feelings. Fifth, require a response. 
Phrase your message so that it makes the listener obligated to respond. One good way to end your statement is with a question to the listener, such as, what do you think? Or, don't you agree? These imply that you're seeking a response to your statement. Sixth and last, don't let it go. Don't let the other person off the hook or disengage the communication process until you're sure you've got a clear understanding. Thanks. Ever walk into your favorite restaurant and the waitress says to you, The usual? You got it. Okay. Isn't that nice? No big explanation. That's the advantage of the standardized communications tool. Tracy and I have developed an SOP, a standard operating procedure. We've rehearsed it often enough that we both know the usual means two eggs over medium, hold the hash browns, bacon extra crispy, whole wheat toast with butter on the side, and coffee with a cream and two sugars. In this case, two words convey the same meaning as 25. Standard communication procedures keep discussion to a minimum. They also allow for faster integration of new crew members or between crews that haven't worked together before. On the fire line, when the pressure's on and time is short, is when effective communication is needed most. But this is also when the barriers are at their worst. Frequent switching between sender and receiver is hard to do, sometimes making regular communication almost impossible. As firefighters, we have to communicate quickly and get to the point. That's why we have standard radio procedures, signals, symbols, and definitions. You never know from fire to fire who you're going to be working with. So the more you know about standardized communications, the easier it is to integrate into any ongoing operation. And Ooh. here's the usual. Thank you very much. You Looks great. So far, we've seen that as professional firefighters, you have a duty to maintain communication to superiors and subordinates, among your coworkers, and with other crews at all times. Open communication increases your crew's situation awareness. We also talked about barriers to communication and tools you can use to improve your ability to communicate effectively. Now, we're going to bring all these together and apply them as your five communication responsibilities on the fire line. Briefing, debriefing, communicating hazards to others, acknowledging and understanding messages, asking if you don't know. These responsibilities are the final communication tool we'll discuss. The first communication responsibility is the briefing. Now you may have been to a pre-shift briefing and you probably think a briefing is something you get from your supervisor, but that's not always true. Everyone has the responsibility to brief others. For example, when someone from another crew who may be new to the fire asks you what's happening, you conduct a brief. Hey guys, can you hold up a second? Yeah. Hi, I just got in with a strike team of engines. We're looking for uh, Division H. Yeah, that's Division H. Pretty big place, though. We've got about six shock crews and a bunch of dozers here. Pretty spread out. Uh, that sounds typical. This is my first big fire of the season. Yeah, I wish I could tell you where the Division Soup is, but we just got dropped off here. We haven't seen him. Uh, that's no big deal. Um, we're supposed to do a hose lay at uh, Drop Point 8. Do you have any idea where Drop Point 8 might be? Yeah, um, Drop Point 8 is about a quarter mile down the road and a big bend in the trees. You can't miss it. It's just, just right there. So. Okay, cool. That, that sounds great. You, you guys been here a while? Uh, yeah, I got here yesterday morning. Oh, good. Can you, can you give me some info on what's going on with the fire? Yeah, um, got here yesterday morning, and uh, this is Division H. Um, we, uh, the fire made a pretty good run up this slope right here yesterday morning, um, and about 1,500 at uh, 
we've had some problems with uh, fire behavior and spotting um, due to the winds yesterday and uh, um, about 1500 and we were down here today we're down here our crew um, flanking this side cutting off a bunch of fingers in preparation to burn tonight past drop point eight there um, they the expected weather for today is um, pretty much what it was yesterday hot and dry and um, around 14 1500 they're expecting these northwest winds um, to bring in some problem fire behavior how far does uh, uh, Division H go down? Uh, just past drop point eight there, and then it it turns into Division I, and um, you'll see a crew down there, um, Mesa number one, I think, and um, Hal uh, Hal Brown is the crew boss, and that's about all I can tell you. Well, what tack frequency are you guys working off of? Uh, one sixty eight three hundred. Okay, hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. All right, no problem. Take it easy. Okay, you too. The second communication responsibility is to debrief. Exactly what is a debrief? Well, there are a lot of terms for this process. After action review, critique, post-mortem exercise. The names don't really matter, but the concept is vital. The most successful high-risk work teams use this review process. Now this isn't about whining or laying blame, it's about learning what happened. So the next time around, the crew performs a little better. Now John, you were kind of in the middle, right? I was one down from Rich. Okay, yeah. so how, how did it go from your perspective? It seemed awfully slow. Although a review of the fire might be useful after it's over, the most effective after-action review will occur right after each operational period. This is when everything is still fresh in your mind and everyone that was there is still around. This is the terrain we're fighting in. We've got, we're going to either be going uphill or downhill. And, well, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, it's all right. The other thing is, too, though, is that, you As know, a crew you, member, you have to stop. It's important not only for you to be there, but also to actively participate. Every professional firefighter must evaluate what's happened and apply what he or she has learned. That's the heart and soul of the After Action Review, or AAR, as it's sometimes called. The After Action Review consists of four basic parts. What was planned? What actually happened? Why did it happen? And what can we do better next time? Going through the debriefing process helps to improve you and your crew's performance each and every time you go out. The third communications responsibility is to identify hazards for others. This is essential for professionals working in any high-risk environment. Every firefighter has an obligation to keep others informed of potential danger. In the military, every paratrooper, from general to private, knows that during a jump, when they see something they perceive as unsafe, it's their duty to stop the jump. They do this through using a standard signal of placing their hand palm forward on top of the anchor line cable. This is their standard operating procedure for communicating a hazard, and it's part of their professional duty. Even if they're unsure about whether there's a problem or not, these soldiers know it's better to run the risk of a little embarrassment if they're wrong, rather than have a death or injury of someone else on their conscience. The leaders here usually make a point of recognizing that the person had the moral courage to do the right thing, regardless of whether or not there was a major hazard. We've all seen what can happen to a message if it's not completely understood. Which brings us to the next step in your communications responsibilities. Remember a little while ago when I was talking about the importance of frequently changing roles between sender and receiver? Well, this technique goes hand in hand with your responsibility to acknowledge and understand the messages you receive. Just as direct statements reinforce the sender side of the communication process, receivers can also do things to make the process more effective. That's what the responsibility to acknowledge and understand messages is all about. Now one of the easiest ways to understand a message is simply to repeat the sender. This is a common procedure in most standard radio communications. South of 63, they're going to leave the A-10s runway heading and uh, after the gear departure, turn right heading 230 and join J-7. Uh, this is departure, heading to South of 63, contact departure. Good day. Departure, South of 63.
you can do the same thing when you're in the role of the receiver. This not only verifies that you have the message correct, it also gives feedback to the sender that the message was understood. The fire line is a constantly changing environment. As a firefighter, you're expected to adapt and change to meet the challenges these changing conditions present and still accomplish your mission. So to be adaptable, you have to understand the mission. In the military, they call this concept commander's intent. Understanding the objectives of the mission enables soldiers to adapt and to improvise when events don't go as planned. When we talk about the responsibility to acknowledge and understand a message, a big part of understanding is knowing the sender's intent. Have you ever been given instructions for a task where you weren't completely sure what you were expected to do? It happens, doesn't it? Well, as a supervisor, giving instructions, you need to make sure that the listener understands your intent. And as a firefighter receiving those instructions, you need to make sure you understand the message and its intent, and that you acknowledge to the sender that you do understand. If you don't, ask questions. Keep that communication cycle going until you know everything you need to know. And that's the fifth communications responsibility. If you don't know, ask. Watch out for firewalls. Hey, watch out for firewalls. Watch out for firewalls. Watch out for firewalls. Firewall? What's a firewall anyway? What's a firewall? I don't know. What's a firewall? Hey, what's a firewall? What's a firewall? No, no, I said firewall. Watch for firewall. Oh, okay. Fire worlds, you know. Fire worlds. Oh, God. Fire worlds. Okay. Good leaders appreciate and value a crew member who asks questions because they know that crew member is paying attention and actively listening. Good leaders also know that it's better to take the time to answer a question now than to fix a mistake later. A variety of experience levels on a crew makes asking questions even more critical. A new or lesser experienced crew member might not understand what the leader assumes everybody already knows. If you're an experienced crew member, you can set the tone for this responsibility by asking questions, especially at debriefings. Even if you already know the answers, your questions will help clarify the issues for lesser experienced members of the crew and set an example for the new crew members so they won't be afraid to ask questions in the future. As a member of the team, You've got the responsibility to make your co-workers better at what they do. Earlier, we saw a special forces team in action during a training mission. If you'll recall, the leader of the team began facilitating an after-action review immediately following the mission. Now let's listen as that same leader, Mark Smith, discusses the history and purpose of the after-action review. The practice that is, as it exists now uh, probably came into to being in the 1980s in, in the military as a result of uh, officers after the Vietnam War getting together and wanting to reinstitute a lot of these organizational learning practices. And when I say reinstitute, uh, this stuff used to be done a thousand years ago uh, around the campfire at night. You know, armies would, would rarely fight at night. Most of them would fight during the day. And at night, the campfires would be lit, and all the soldiers would sit around the campfire and basically talk about what happened that day, talk about what went right, talk about what went wrong, uh, help each other uh, diffuse the stress of seeing you know, comrades that were killed or these kinds of traumatic things that happen, and most importantly, what to do different next time, which was usually when the sun rose. You know, they had an immediate opportunity to apply that learning to the very next day of the battle. Well, I think the last time that we as Americans really saw this practice is in the Civil War. You know, we have a lot of media and movies and stories and poetry and, and whatnot that talks about that, what happens around the campfire at camp at night with the soldiers. Um, then I think we go to World War I, which dramatically changed how wars were fought. Um, it, it was fought 
on a more round-the-clock basis, or there was a lot of stagnation, but it wasn't very well used. You know, commanders were now miles into the rear, and technology had enabled all these new things to go on, and we lost that practice. And where the roots of the modern AAR really came back was in World War II in the Pacific. In 1943, one of the foremost military historians, SLA Marshall, uh, was tasked by the Center for Military History to go uh, and interview soldiers en masse from the 7th Infantry Division after their campaigns in Kwajalein and the Marshall Islands and the Pacific in 1943. And he had to develop these techniques of how to interview groups, platoons, companies of soldiers uh, as a large group. And those techniques are really what came into the modern practice of the after action review. So after Vietnam, uh, a lot of officers and NCOs felt frustrated that we weren't a learning organization in the Army or the other armed services. And that generation really rededicated to them, themselves to bringing back the practice of organizational learning, which is how the after action review came into being. But essentially, the practice really gained traction in our combat training centers. Uh, that's where whole units, uh, 400, 600,000 people would go train for a month or so in a completely virtual combat environment. It's very realistic. You know, you really feel like you're there in, in this fictional country fighting this enemy who are some of the best soldiers that uh, the Army has to offer. And the need to continuously improve, because if you didn't improve, you were going to have your head handed to you by the bad guys the very next day. So there's a lot of motivation to improve. And that is really where the practice gained shape because people could see the immediate results. They could talk about something, they could do it in a professional way, they could go out the very next day and implement it and watch their performance improve. And you can't argue with results. And so over, over time, throughout the 90s or late 80s, early 90s, the Gulf War, that practice really became accepted. Okay. Oh, absolutely, there's a lot of parallel application right now in other environments. Uh, talking about the combat training center and how we were able to use it to immediately see performance. Now, in online gaming, you're seeing exactly the same thing. All these groups of, of people spread all over the country are trying to work as a unit in these online games and advance to the next level. They're getting their butts kicked by the game. Yeah, they want to improve, and they're, they're literally doing virtual online AARs in order to improve. But uh, BMW Cycle regularly institutes after-action reviews. So you're seeing it all throughout industry, the medical profession, non-governmental organizations in Africa are patterning themselves off of that learning organization template. Uh, Harvard Business School, you know, Dr. David Garvin has written a lot of excellent material on learning in action. So it's really going uh, to many environments and many industries and applications. Uh, the, the return on investment of an after action review is almost immediate. So as your crew conducts an after action review on day two of a 14 day assignment, you get to go right out the next day and apply that learning. You, know, you can decompose what happened on today's assignment who was where, how did that fit against our plan, what caused those things to occur, good, bad, indifferent, uh, how do we do it again tomorrow, and go immediately out and put those things into practice. So you get people who are innovating at the Firefighter 2 level. They are bringing innovation to the ground on that assignment, on that division, on that branch, on that incident, and hopefully that's occurring on every uh, every assignment going on on that incident. Uh, people are going to feel bought in to what your crew is doing, what the team's doing, because they're part of the solution. They're no longer part of the problem. They're there helping to fix it. Uh, and if you can, if you can get 1% better every day in your assignment, wherever it is, whether it's ground unit support leader or your, you know, trail Pulaski on a hotshot crew, that's got to lead to organizational success.
southeast corner, a little bit of spotting across this uh, unit. So far, we've spent a lot of time on the concept of situation awareness as your connection to reality. We've also focused on effective communication, and we've looked at some ways that barriers can be reduced in order to improve our situation awareness and communication processes. I see you're you know, 3190. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, you want me to support? As you're probably starting to guess, situation awareness serves as a foundation for many things, and this is true for decision making as well. Fireline decision making can be a complicated business. The fire conditions and situation continually change. The terrain, weather, fuels, and people all come together in a perpetually unique mix. Okay, you got a good head count. We got RC up here with us. Okay, I'm here with three. Firefighters face a wide range of variables in a high-risk environment. Decisions force interaction with the environment. So decision-making is where your situation awareness meets real life head-on. Before we go any further, let's check your decision-making ability. Take 10 seconds to look at the following situation and decide what to do. The correct action in this situation is A, indirect attack, B, direct attack, or C, disengage and gather more information. Well, what did you decide? I'm sure most of you were able to make a decision. Doesn't really matter what the decision was, you still made some kind of decision. So your decision-making machinery is working just fine. Decision-making machinery. What do we mean by that? For this vehicle's engine to start, things like spark, fuel, and air are brought together at the right time and in the right amounts to make the starting process happen. Even if the driver doesn't realize it, getting this engine to start quickly and smoothly is a matter of process, not just turning the key. Similarly, your decisions don't just happen. When you make a decision, you follow a process, whether you realize it or not. Like situation awareness, the decision-making process is fairly simple. And like situation awareness, you have the ability to open the hood on the decision-making machine and improve its performance a little. The decision process, like situation awareness, is a cycle. But in this case, the cycle moves between you and the outside world. Although there are many academic descriptions for the process, most of them boil down to four basic steps. Recognition, option selection, decision point, and an action. And this whole process runs against time. The end result of the decision process is an action, which is how you interact with the outside world. Your action will hopefully affect a desired change on the outside world. Without your action, the world just goes on without you. That's why there's such an emphasis on decision-making in the fire environment. Errors in situation awareness lead to errors in decision-making. Bad decisions produce wrong actions, or in some cases, inaction, when actions should be taken. Error chains such as this are the path to poor performance and accidents. Just as it was for situation awareness and for communication, there are tools you can use to improve your decision-making ability. To show you what I mean, let's take a closer look at the decision-making cycle. Your decision process starts with the realization or recognition that something is wrong or that an important factor has changed. It could be something that requires your reaction or perhaps you decide to try and affect the outcome of a situation. In all of these cases, your awareness will start to focus around a particular problem or issue, and you recognize that some future action may be necessary. As you can imagine, early recognition of a problem requires good situation awareness. Say you're working the fire line and fail to notice that the fire has jumped the line behind you. As long as you're not aware of it, you won't realize there's a problem. If you don't notice this change in the environment, your decision process, which should lead you to action, never gets started. The next step in the decision process is option selection. That is, choosing your course of action. Depending on the time pressure and the situation, this step can be very quick or very involved. If you remember only one word about option selection, it should be experience. Now, that may seem obvious, but in order to understand how you can improve your decision-making, we first need to look at what experience is all about. 
experience, seasoning, wisdom, judgment, whatever you want to call it, everyone has it. A person's life experience includes many activities and skills ranging from driving a car to playing a card game to raising a child and, yes, to firefighting. Some of this experience transfers from one subject to another. Some of it doesn't. Most of your firefighting experience has been acquired through three channels, training, field experience, and pre-planning. Let's examine training first. Training is a directed or guided experience, just like what you're doing now. Classroom, self-study, and field practice are all examples of training. Training usually gives you a fundamental knowledge and understanding about a subject. All right, guys, today we're going to be greasing the clutch bearing. It's real important to do that. Especially on you should always take advantage of training when it's offered and strive to learn as much as you can from it. Also, remember that many training opportunities aren't scheduled or formal. In fact, they sometimes come up when you least expect them. If you don't know how something works, be prepared to learn how it does. If you know how it works, be prepared to teach it to someone else. Most of us think that training is good, but there's nothing like the real thing. Field experience out on the line where principles and techniques that you learned in training are being applied. The good thing about field experience is that it's as real as it gets. But because field experience isn't directed and controlled like training, anything can happen. By anything, I mean both good and bad lessons are learned through your field experience. This is why the after-action review is so important. As we saw before, both good and bad performance is discussed during the after-action review. The good lessons are reinforced, while the bad lessons can be corrected on the spot. The after-action review process helps to assure that everyone learns the right lessons in the field. The third channel of experience is pre-planning. Now, you may ask, is pre-planning really experience? You bet it is. Just as an aircraft simulator provides a virtual experience for these pilots, your mind provides a simulation when you go through the process of pre-planning something. During the morning briefing, and then as you travel to your assignment, you visualize what your expectations are, what the fire behavior will be like, the terrain, the hazards, the weather. You think about what features might make good safety zones in this particular area. You think about which indicators will tell you something has changed and how you might respond to those changes. Establishing a good routine of doing pre-planning before embarking on an assignment helps you to hone your recognition skills in advance and gives you a better understanding of what potential problems might crop up. But pre-planning is not just for the new firefighter. Routine pre-planning helps experienced firefighters guard against complacency and helps keep the awareness level up. The pre-planning experience can be helpful but it's a perishable commodity. Once reality has overcome the scope of your plan, the experience gained from the pre-planning effort is gone. That's why it's important to be prepared for things to go wrong. The better your pre-planning efforts, the more likely events will stay within your expectations. Just as the virtual experience of pre-planning stops as soon as you stray too far from your plan, your other fire experiences only transfer to new situations in a general sense. Your experience resource is only good as long as it's similar to situations you've seen before. Once you stray very far from your previous experience, either in training, pre-planning, or your own field experiences, you're in new decisional territory, and that's an important realization to make. Let's take a look at an example of this. Sue has worked all of her six years fighting fire here in the southeast, and most of her training has been done in this area. She's been in a leadership role for her crew for the last two years, is a qualified crew boss, and has worked in this fuel type and terrain frequently. Much of her fire experience has been similar to today's assignment, a fire in palmetto and gallberry fuels. In short, she's in familiar territory. Technically, Frank here is more experienced. 
He's a qualified division supervisor and has almost twice as many years of fire experience as Sue. He spent two years as a smoke jumper in Alaska and is currently in charge of a Nevada-based engine crew. Before today, he's fought only one fire in this part of the country. His assignment today is to work with a tractor plow, and he hasn't done that before. Although very experienced, Frank is unfamiliar with the local factors. The cumulative amount of relevant experience Frank can bring to bear on today's situation is less than he's used to, and he may be at a decisional disadvantage. Although Frank can't increase his level of field experience right now, he can compensate in other ways by seeking out a briefing on tractor plow operations and getting some quick training on the spot, Frank can improve his experience level. He can also improve his experience level through a pre-plan, especially if it can be done in conjunction with other experienced personnel. Your experience helps you only in situations that are similar to those you've encountered in the past. As a firefighter, you can be sent to places with different fuels, unfamiliar weather patterns, or where the tactics they use are new to you. So always ask yourself, am I getting all the information I need? Do I need a better briefing? Am I doing enough pre-planning for this situation? The responsibility is yours to recognize when you might be on unfamiliar ground and to answer all these questions for yourself. They say you never run out of options, just out of time. In other words, whether or not you select a course of action, the situation will continue unabated. The clock will keep on ticking until eventually you lose the option to make an effective decision. What happens during the option selection step varies depending on the amount of time you have and how experienced you are. In situations where you have time, you can brainstorm some possible ways to approach the problem. You can identify the possible options and carefully weigh the risks the chances of failure, and the importance of the issue. But in dynamic, high-risk situations, fully developing and analyzing each possible course of action is not realistic. There just isn't time. While inexperienced firefighters tend to be overwhelmed by the onslaught of information or time pressure and take longer to select their course of action, experienced firefighters seem to get through this process a lot easier and quicker. Although the old hands seem to make decisions from their gut or by instinct, these very experienced people are really just operating out of their experience pool, like everyone else. They just have a bigger pool to draw from, meaning they've faced more situations and have the results of their decisions from those situations stored in their head. The academic name for this process is Recognition Primed Decision Making, or RPD. By matching the current situation with something they've already seen, experienced people can automatically select a viable option without having to weigh the pros and cons of it. If it worked before, it'll probably work again. Because they have this pre-built reserve of options, experienced decision makers usually can handle stress and information overload better than the new firefighter. The race against time is the biggest factor that separates the experienced decision maker from the inexperienced decision maker. So what's the newer firefighter to do? Just as pre-planning is an important tool to help you recognize problems, it's also a great way to take the time pressure off your important decisions. By pre-planning, you're essentially priming your decision machinery, setting up the recognition tripwires for expected or possible changes, and then setting up possible solutions in advance so that you don't have to think about them on the spot when the pressure is on. Pre-planning isn't limited to just before a shift. It's just a planning activity before you do something. There'll be times on the line when you've got to redraw a plan in mid-stride and keep going from there. Now, except in extreme emergency situations, there's always time to formulate some kind of a plan and get it communicated. It doesn't have to be a long, elaborate process. It just has to cover the critical aspects of the task at hand. The fire's starting to move across the drains there. It looks like it might spot. Yeah, that fire activity is definitely more than we'd expected today. Yeah, escape route's right up there by those rocks. Let's just head for it right now. Well, the fire and the slope, I think we 
might not beat the fire to those rocks. So why don't we go ahead and take a look at the map and look for a secondary escape route. Okay. Look here. Last shift when I was down snagging in this drainage, there's a creek that runs along the bottom of it down into a marsh, which is right below our safety zone. I think if we get down to that creek, we'll be beneath the fire. We won't have to get above it. We'll be in a good spot. Sounds like a good backup plan. Well, let's do it then. All right. The backup plan those two firefighters just made is called contingency planning. Now that's important because the more plans we can make ahead of time, the more time we have later to deal with those unexpected decisions we always have to face when Murphy's Law comes into play. As you move through the decision-making process, you get to that critical decision point where you must initiate an action in order to carry out the option you selected. Now, this action might impact many people, or it might be as simple as asking a question now rather than later. Hopefully, your decision and action change the situation for the better, after which you maintain your situation awareness to analyze the new situation, look for changes, and begin the whole cycle all over again. If you know yourself, how the process works, and how to recognize barriers and errors within the process, you'll be a big step ahead on the road toward getting your decision-making machinery in top condition.